The most common joints that we have in our body are the synovial joints. And remember that the term synovial is a structural classification. And it's describing the fact that there is a synovial cavity present. And remember that the functional classification for this is diarthrotic because these joints have free movement about them. Now there's an important table that you need to study in uh, chapter 8. It's table 8.2 and in this important table it classifies these joints based on structure and function and when you look in the last column it lists the type of function that's allowed. And there are six different types of synovial joints, which we're going to go through in the next few slides here. And this is one of the focus figure that, figures that's found in Chapter 8 in your textbook. And the first example here is a planar joint. And the planar joint that is shown here would be the one that would be found between the carpals. And in this case, there's a flat articular surface that doesn't allow, um, it really only allows slipping to occur. And it is not even considered to be uniaxial. And besides the intercarpal joints, the intertarsal joints are also planar. And there's also some examples that are the intervertebral joints. And these are found between the articular processes. They allow for gliding to occur. There's also another example, which is the costovertebral. And in this example, this would be found between the costal cartilage, which remember is a type of hyaline cartilage, as well as the vertebrae. And uh, some of the other examples of planar joints are also going to include the carpometacarpals, which would be found in specifically in the digits two through five. So some of the carpometacarpal joints would also be planar. And the, again, these are also found in that table. Another example of a planar joint would be the femoropatellar joint. And so this would be between the flat surface of the uh, femur and where it articulates with the patella. Another example would be the proximal tibiofibular joint. So where the tibia and the fibula are going to articulate. And then we also have the tarsometatarsal joint, which would be in addition to the intertarsal joint. Our next slide is showing a hinge joint, and the hinge joint is a very common joint. It's a uniaxial type of joint where it allows for flexion and extension. Recall that flexion is the decrease of the angle between two bones. Extension would be the opposite, increasing the angle between the two bones. And a very common example of this would be right at the elbow joint. Remember, the elbow joint occurs because of the ulna articulating with the humerus. So in this case it really doesn't have anything to do with the radius. And some other important examples of hinge joints would be the interphalangeal joints would be another example. Also between the ulna and the radius uh, specifically. And then a um, other examples of this, we can um, think of the ankle joint, the tibia, and the fibula with the talus. And then the knee joint is also a modified hinge joint as well. So part of it is a hinge joint, and this would be between the femur and the tibia, so modified hinge joint. And then also the adjacent phalanges that are also in the toe. So um, the interphalangeal joints, remember that term is going to apply not only to the hand, so 
the phalanges that are in the hand, but it also applies to the feet because we use that term phalanges for the feet as well. The third slide here is showing the pivot joint. The pivot joint, remember, is going to allow for a bit of rotation that occurs, and so one example would be between C1, which is the atlas, and the axis, which is C2. Other examples of this would be what you see on the slide here, the pivoting that is allowed between the radius and the ulna. There's also another one, which is actually located at the distal end of the radius and the ulna. So this would be the distal radial ulnar joint. So there aren't as many examples of the pivot joint as there are the other two. So again, you need to be able to recognize which ones are uniaxial, which ones are non-axial. Now the next couple slides are going to show biaxial movement. And a biaxial uh, would occur in two different planes. And in this case, a condyloid joint we, it's formed because of oval articular surfaces. And so the metacarpophalangeal, the knuckle joints, are examples of condylar joints. There's also another example that would be the atlanto, which again is C1, occipital. So this is what actually allows you your head to, to shake your head yes. And it's the articulation between the occipital bone of the skull and the atlas, which is C1. Another example is the one you see on the screen, the knuckle joint. And then another example would also be at the metatarsophalangeal joint. So it's going to be very similar to the picture that we have on this slide. It's just that it's found in the foot itself. So it's important for you to know the type of movement that's going to be allowed by these joints. The next one is a saddle joint. And one of the only saddle joints that we have in our body would be the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb. So this is kind of what allows you to actually to twiddle your thumb. This one is going to be biaxial. It's going to allow for flexion extension as you can see on this slide. It allows for abduction and adduction. It also allows for circumduction as well as opposition of metacarpal one. Remember from the last mini lecture that opposition is the movement of the thumb to the opposite or to another phalange. Then we have the uh, joint that's going to allow for the most amount of movement. This would be a multi-axial joint, which would be the ball and socket joint. And these of course would be the glenohumeral joint. The glenohumeral joint is named because of the parts of the bones that are going to articulate. So we have the glenoid cavity articulating with the ball, the um, ball of the proximal end of the humerus. So this is going to allow for an abundant about amount of movement. It's going to allow for flexion and extension, abduction, adduction, rotation of the humerus, and it's also going to allow for circumduction. Then the other example of a ball and socket joint is going to be the hip joint. And this is going to be also called the coxal joint. And it's between the hip bone and the femur. And this is also going to allow for a lot of different movement. Now again it's important that you can kind of compare and contrast these two. So the shoulder joint is going to allow for more movement, but with that 
greater amount of movement it's going to give up stability and the hip joint is just going to be the opposite it's going to have less movement but much more stability our next slide is showing some of the selected synovial joints and one of these important ones that you need to know would be the knee joint so let's go through some of this anatomy you have these figures that are in your textbook the knee joint is the largest most complex of all the knee joints it really consists of three joints in one it's got the femoropatellar joint the tibiofemoral joints there's one on the lateral side and the medial side and remember that it's these synovial joints that are going to have the most supporting material to prevent injury so the tib tibiofemoral joint is going to be primarily a hinge joint it's going to be a modified hinge joint it's going to permit permit for flexion and extension which are the two primary examples of movements that would be allowed by hinge joints uh, but when the the knee is going to be fully extended side to side movements and rotation are going to um, would be possible but some of these ligaments and in, in the menisci are going to prevent that the femoropatellar joint is going to be a planar joint and so this is going only only going to allow for gliding movement to occur and so let's look at some of this important anatomy and I'll go through and highlight the important anatomy that you're responsible for obviously the femur the articular capsule remember you need to be aware of the intra capsular ligaments like the PCL the posterior cruciate ligament as well as the ACL which is the anterior cruciate ligament and we can also see these shown on the bottom diagram the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament you all should also need to know the supporting fibrocartilage pads which are the menisci the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus as well as the bursae which are going to help to prevent injury Remember, the bursae are going to be filled with synovial fluid we have bursae that are strategically located to absorb extra shock there are ligaments remember the ligaments are attaching bone to bone so you're really responsible for most of the items that are listed on this diagram now the anterior cruciate ligament is very important and in this case the anterior cruciate ligament it is going to prevent forward sliding of the tibia on the femur so it prevents forward sliding of the tibia on the femur So it can uh, prevent things like hyperextension of the knee and it kind of makes sense as to where it would be attached it's going to be attached to the anterior side of the tibia whereas the PCL the posterior cruciate ligament is going to be just doing the opposite it's attached to the posterior area as we can see right here and it's um, it's going to prevent backward displacement of the tibia so backward displacement of tibia this next slide is showing an anterior view of the knee and some of the important important structures that you're responsible for and uh, you don't need to know the retinaculum but you should know the quadriceps femoris muscle you're gonna have to learn this when we get to 
chapter 10, but the quadriceps femoris muscle is really a group of several muscles. A tendon, again, remember, is attaching a muscle, as you can see here, to a bone. So you need to know the difference between a tendon and a ligament. The fibular collateral ligament is important to know. This would be one of the examples of the extra capsular ligaments. And then we have the um, patellar ligament. And as you can see here, the patellar ligament is going to be attaching bone to bone. So bone to bone. And the fibular collateral ligament is also more commonly called the lateral collateral ligament because you know that the fibula is on the lateral side and the tibial collateral ligament is also called the MCL, the medial collateral ligament, because again the tibia is on the medial side. This next slide is showing more of the supporting structures and as I mentioned a couple slides ago uh, you need to know the function of the anterior cruciate ligament and since it's attached to the anterior surface it's going to prevent forward movement of the tibia and backward movement of the femur but the posterior cruciate ligament is going to do just the opposite so again you need to be able to recognize most of these structures that are shown here posterior cruciate ligament which is again intracapsular anterior cruciate ligament the menisci patella and the quadriceps tendons.